بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد First of all, we'd like to welcome brothers and sisters to our Winter Conference 2022. Alhamdulillah, we used to hold this conference every year until the COVID came in. We have, uh, we have been restricted in holding this type of gathering. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for us to be able to hold Winter Conference this year, inshallah. And our theme of our conference say, What taqu yawman turja'una fihi ila Allah? And fear the day we are going to be brought back to Allah. According to the Mufassirun, those who translated the Quran, they're saying this is the last ayah to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before he departed from this world. What taqu yawman turja'una fihi ila Allah? Fear the day you are going to be returned to your Lord. So, Alhamdulillah, we have the occasion to welcome Al-Akh Lutfi Ja'far. He is, if most of you know him, he has been with us so many years. He became this master belief since 2014, 2015. For the last seven, eight years, he's coming all the way from London. And today, he is with us today, you about one speaker. And his topic will be Holding on to your deen is maintaining your Islamic identity. As we know, we are living in challenging times. And these challenging times we're living in, the most important thing that we need is to stick on or to hold on is our deen. So, Al Akh Dutfi is here with us today. The talk will be about roughly 45 minutes. And then they'll be followed with Q&A, question and answers. If you have any questions, you'd be quite happy to help. Khalid Fadl Mashkuru. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd, ikhwat al-imani wal-islam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is an honor to be here again with you, brothers and Islam. Remembering the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the name of Allah, the oneness of Allah, and trying our best to revive the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Indeed, it is a duty upon us to remember Allah and revive the sunnah of his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as much as, as much as we can. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and to make us sincere and to make us follow the path of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until we meet him ameen ya rabbi alameen. Ikhwat al-Iman wa islam brothers and sisters in Islam, holding on to your deen in our societies today, in our century today, it's a challenge for many of us, especially when living in the West, in a country that is not predominantly Muslim. However, as we know and as we believe, Islam الحمد, has solutions for every crisis we humans might face in our life. It doesn't matter which time it is, which community it is, which location it is, which crisis they are, Islam has always a solution for us. For as long as we stick to the true sources of Islam, such as the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as well as the correct understanding of the scholars of this Ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us follow their path, Ameen Ya Rabbi Alameen then we will be holding to our deen for as long as these are the three sources for our way of life for the deen of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma and the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah based on the first three generations uh, of Islam walillahi alhamd I would like to start this talk by a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He was talking to Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu wa Allah. Anas reports to us saying, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى يُكْثِرُ أَنْ يَقُولُ اللَّهُمَّ يَا مُتَبِّتَ قُلُوبِ تَبِّتْ قَلْبِ عَلَى دِينَكِ Anas reports to us, the Messenger of Allah used to say this dua very often. 
What dua is this? The one you just had in Arabic. Allahumma ya muthabbit al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, you are the controller of hearts. So make my heart firm upon your religion. Make my heart firm upon your religion. Anas went on to say to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, Amanna bima jitta bihi. Wattaba'naak. Alfa takhafu alayna ya Rasulullah. He says, O the Messenger of Allah, we believe in that which he came with, the Quran and the Sunnah. And we followed you, O the Messenger of Allah. Do you still fear for us to be misguided? قال عليه أفضل الصلاة والتسليم قال يا أنس إن قلوب العباد بين أسبوعين من أصابع الرحمن يقلبها كيف يشاء. He taught Anas bin Malik a very important lesson. O Anas, the hearts of the people are within the fingers of Rahman. He changes their condition however he wishes. I.e. Guidance comes from Allah. Guidance and hidayah in Islam is divided into two types. Please remember this. This is a very important concept in Islam. Al hidayah or guidance or al huda is divided into two types. Number one, hidayah to tawfiq, and number two, hidayah to dilala or dalil. The first one, the guidance which is a tawfiq, related tawfiq, i.e. the good fortune that Allah will bless you with. And the second type of guidance, hidayah, is the guidance of instructions and directions. I'll give you an example. If Allah wants to guide someone to righteousness, He will guide you no matter who you are. Even if you're the worst of the worst, Allah will guide you. He will take you out from there and He will guide you. Why? Because Allah gave you a special tawfiq a special chance, good fortune, gifted to you by Allah. Because Allah does whatever He wishes, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a gift from Allah. And the second type of guidance is the guidance of direction and instructions. For example, if you ask me, how do I pray in Islam? I guide you to the correct way to pray. I tell you that's what you should say, that's what you should do, and that's what you should avoid. And that's the correct way to pray. So I am guiding you through uh, the prophetic instructions, the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu If you ask me where is the station of Northampton, I tell you, you go straight, you turn left, and then you go down, and the station is there, okay? So I showed you where it is. But it is up to you whether you want to reach there or not. It is up to you whether you take my direction and advice I gave you, okay? So you choose whether you want to be guided or not guided. Guidance was presented to you, but it's your choice. Do we understand the difference between the two? Alhamdulillah. So that's why the Prophet Muhammad says, our hearts are within the fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He changes them, he changes the conditions of our heart, however he wishes. Allah says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ And bear in your mind, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the conditions of the person however he wishes. Huh? Today Allah keeps blessing you with knowledge, with wealth, with family. Tomorrow he might take that away from you as what? As a test. Today Allah keeps testing you with hardships and struggles upon struggles. And then there will come a day where Allah will bless you with ease and success. So Allah keeps testing you and changing your conditions according to what you want because Allah knows what's in your heart. And this hadith is a principle in Islam. Your actions are based on your intentions and you will indeed be rewarded according to your intention. If Allah sees your intention is pure and clean and you want sincerity, you want guidance, then indeed you will have that. You will have it at one point in your life. But if Allah says your intention is not good, you don't want to be guided, you don't want the right path, then Allah will allow you to do as you please in this life. But when you meet him in the next life, you will not be able to do anything 
except listen to the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very important to repeat this dua as often as you can. Since the Prophet himself, sallallahu is the best man stepped on this earth, used to repeat this dua very often as Anas reported to us in Surah Ibn Majah. Then who are you and who am I not to repeat this dua very often? Some scholars recommend that this dua should be in every salat in your sujood. Allahumma ya muthabbit al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Remember this dua, it's in the fortress of the Muslim. Memorize it. We know from many different stories, one of the most famous stories is the story of Harun in the Quran al Karim. He was a righteous person. Allah blessed him with knowledge, with righteousness, with piety, and with massive wealth. His story is in Surah Al Qasas. After some time, he was deceived by his pride. What did he do? He rebelled and became ungrateful to the blessings of Allah. And he denied that these blessings are from Allah and he claimed to have it himself because of his talent, his virtues. What did Allah do to him? Destroyed him and his wealth. And we have other stories, such as Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu Allah in the Jahiliyyah before, before Islam. He used to worship idols. On his journey when traveling, he used to make small idols with dates. And then when he gets hungry, in the middle of nowhere, what does he do? He eats it. And then he embraced Islam and became one of what? One of the symbols of this religion. Wallah alhamd. One of the leaders of this deen. So alhamdulillah, ikhwat al-imani wa islam For us to hold tight to our deen and be firm, number one, you have to relate it to Allah. Not your cleverness, not your knowledge, not your community, not your piety. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yahdi man yasha wa yudillu man yasha. Allah guides whom he wishes and he misguides whom he wishes. Therefore, any ni'mah, any blessings, any good that might come to you in your life, relate it to Allah. Allah says, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Ask for the blessings of your Lord, let people know about it. Alhamdulillah. Never be arrogant. The opposite of that is what? Saying myself, myself. I've done this. I do this. This is what will lead you to Jahannam. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. A person who has this small dot of arrogance and pride in their heart will not be able to enter Jannah. It's very serious. Humble yourself before Allah and beg Him and ask Him and cry before Him to keep you firm upon your deen. In good times and hard times, even when you see yourself very practicing, keep asking Allah to keep you firm. Even if you see yourself far from the deen, ask Allah to survive that statement of La ilaha illallah in your, in your heart because indeed it will save you. If you die upon La ilaha illallah with sincerity, it will save you. At least you don't last in Jahannam forever. If you die as a major sin, I will never repent to Allah. That faith, that aqidah of Tawheed will insha'Allah ta'ala save you. So at all times, in good and hard times, relate it to Allah and ask Allah for His, for his guidance and to continue His blessings upon you. That's step one. Step two, ikhwat al-imani wal-islam to hold, to be successful in holding tight to your deen, <coughs> is seeking knowledge, understanding your religion, exploring your religion. We do not inherit Islam from our parents. Just because your parents is Abdullah and Aisha from a Muslim country, they go to Jumu'ah, they go to Taraweeh, they dress Islamically, they talk Islamically. This does not mean you are automatically a Muslim who is successful, who is going to go to Jannah. No. Islam is not something to be inherited. Islam is something to be embraced and submitted to. That's why it's called what? Al-Islam, which means Al-Istislam Lillah. Submission and absolute surrender to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. His son followed his path until a certain point of his life. 
disobeyed his father during the flooding and chose to, to not get on the boat or the ark with his father. What happened to him? He was considered to be a kafir. And Allah told Noah, don't discuss the situation of your son. Because he died upon Kufr. So this is what it means. You have to embrace Islam. Maybe at a young age, mm -hmm, when you haven't reached the age of puberty and maturity, maybe you inherit Islam because the culture and everything is Islamic. But once you're mature enough, for example, like most of you in here, I see most of you are 10 plus for Allah in hand. Okay? You have to develop your own relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need your mother or your father to wake you up for fajr or to remind you to fast in Ramadan or to remind you to do your Quran or to dress Islamically or to behave Islamically or not to watch certain haram programs. You don't need that anymore. You should be fully aware of your duties in Islam. How do you do that? Is by studying. We know that some of you or some of us, whether an adult or a young person, sometimes struggle to attend Islamic classes, madrasas, and so on and so forth, maybe because of the distance, maybe because of the inconvenience, maybe whatever reason it is. But believe me, this is what going to be our topic perhaps after Asr or after Maghrib, knowledge, seeking knowledge in Islam. Believe me, every step you take to the masjid or to the Islamic center to learn about the Quran or to learn about Islamic studies, you're rewarded for that. It doesn't go in vain. May you read Allah bihi khayran, yufaqihu fi din. If Allah wishes good for someone, He will make you understand His religion, make you study His religion. Once you understand <coughs> Islam correctly, it is impossible for you to skip its application. Once you embrace Islam, and then you study it, and then you understand it correctly, you will automatically apply it in your daily life. If you've done the right steps at the start, I mentioned that. <coughs> so seek your knowledge, Ikhwat al Iman of Islam. That's how you hold tight to your deal. You don't follow blindly. You develop that relationship by knowing who Allah is, by knowing who your messenger is, by knowing what your deen is. The basics, at least. This is between you and Allah. Because on the very day, on the day of judgment, you will stand alone before Allah. No father and no mother and no brother and no sister and no wife and no husband and no friend and no bodyguard will be standing next to you defending you or trying to represent you. No. If you've reached the age of puberty, you're accountable and you will stand before Allah alone. And you will have to answer for your good deeds and your bad deeds. This is why I mean Islam is not inherited. It's gained. It's earned. Is embraced. <coughs> you can never embrace something unless you understand its concept, and that's where knowledge comes. That's number two. Number one, relate every blessing you have to Allah and keep supplicating to Allah to make you firm on the deen. And number two, seek at least the basics of the foundations of Islam. At least the foundations. Number three, you have to befriend with the people who are the people of taqwa. Your friendship, your companionship is very, very important. You cannot be hanging out with people who do haram every morning and every evening and expect yourself to be guided and to have the jannah of Allah and to have the blessings of Allah. No. You have to choose your friends. Do not let your friends choose you, but you choose them your, yourself. You're old enough now. You can make up your mind who's good for you and who's not good for you. A suhba, they call it in Arabic. The Prophet Muhammad mentioned in a very famous hadith, Al mar'u ala deeni khalilih. Fal yanzur ahadukum man yukhalil. A man or a woman is upon the religion of their friend or companion. So let every one of you choose who to befriend with. Remember this principle. You choose your friend. You have a choice. And the advice of the Prophet, he told you to choose your friends. And another hadith, لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا 
ولا يأكل طعامك إلا تقي. Do not be friends except with a believer. The Prophet was very precise in his wordings. Do not be friends except with a believer, not with a Muslim. Because a believer, a mu'min, is a higher grade than what? Than a Muslim. Every mu'min, every believer is a Muslim. But not every Muslim is what? A believer if you want to be very precise in Islam. Okay? A Muslim, anyone can be a Muslim who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and has it in his heart firmly. But a believer is further than that. It's the one who believes in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and applies that in his daily life. Obeys Allah and his messenger at all times. See the difference? قالت الأعراب آمنا قل لم ت قل لم تؤمن ولكن قولوا أسلمنا ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم وإن تطيعوا الله ورسوله لا يلدكم من أعمالكم شيئا. The proof for that is in the Quran. The Arab, a group of Bedouins, a group of Bedouins, people who live in the deserts and they travel around and don't have settlement. They keep traveling, looking for life. They came to the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in Medina and they claimed Iman. قالت الأعراب آمنا. The Arab claimed that we have belief, we have iman. Allah replied to them, saying to Muhammad, قل لم تؤمنوا. Tell them, oh Muhammad, you have not believed yet. But say, we have submitted and surrendered. أسلمنا. ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم. Iman has not entered your heart yet. Because the iman is not about believing in Allah and his messenger only. How many pillars of iman are there? Six. Six. So you learn the belief in Allah, the Tawheed and its concept. And then you got the belief in the angels. The belief in the books of Allah. The belief in what? In the messengers of Allah. And part of the belief of the messengers of Allah is to obey them and follow them, the way of lives. If you don't follow the messengers of Allah, are you a true believer in them? No. You've just submitted to their prophethood and prophecy and their belief. But you haven't obeyed them. That's why Iman has not entered your, your heart fully. To be a believer is to be someone who is mindful of Allah, who practices uh, Islam. So if you separate them, Islam and Iman, they mean the same thing. Very much the same thing. But if you put them together, they can mean slightly different things. That's what I'm trying to say. The Prophet says, لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا do not be friends with, except with a believer, i.e. a practicing Muslim. Because there's many Muslims out there, and Allah guide us and guide them, who love Allah and His Messenger, but they sin day and night. Not just any sins, major sins. Can you be friends with such people? No, you're not allowed Islamically. But can you disown them? No, you should not disown them as a Muslim. You still have to keep in touch with them, hoping that one day they will be guided. Never give up on them. But you choose who to be friends with. Because the Hadith continues saying, and no one should eat your food except what? A person of taqwa, a person of righteousness and piety. What does this mean? It doesn't mean you don't buy food for anyone except a righteous person, no. It means you do not host in your house and in your privacy except someone you trust. And the person you trust, he's got to be someone God-fearing. He fears Allah. Because someone who does not fear Allah, you might have a non-Muslim person who is very trustworthy. But he does not fear Allah, he does not have piety in Allah. So his trustworthiness is only related to his daily actions. So he can be deceived, he can turn into someone who exposes your privacy because he has no boundaries when it comes to the rules of Allah. So you don't take to your privacy or to your house except someone who is God-fearing. So you know that they're not, they're not going to expose your privacy. They're not going to defame you after you left, they left your house. They're not going to cause you any harm or dishonor you and so on and so forth. The Prophet is very precise, Sallallahu So the main message behind this, choose your friends. Choose your friends. This is step three, brothers and sisters in Islam. As for step four, it is holding tight to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we hear this very often, but there is something after this. At all times and in all places. This is very important. In good times and hard times. In Muslim countries, 
and non-Muslim countries. In Muslim communities and non-Muslim communities. In Muslim events and non-Muslim events. If you invite you to a non-Muslim event, whatever it is, graduate from uni or in school or in college, you still have to behave as what? As a Muslim. You still have to express your Islamic identity fairly and wisely. If you don't practice Islam with Muslims in masajid and places of worship, but when you are out there with non-Muslims, you kind of disown or hide your Islamic identity. No, you should never do that. A Muslim should always be proud of being a Muslim. Because being a Muslim means being someone who follows the truth and submits the truth. Being a Muslim means you are the offsprings of the best man stepped on earth. The Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Take pride in that. Never hide your identity because you've got so much to express before those who try to defame you or belittle you as a Muslim. No, you've got a lot to tell them. The, the glory of Islam and the legacy of Islam and the heroes of Islam. What they introduced to this earth and to this world is more than any other civilization or people. Ikhwat al Iman wa Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hal al Qur'ana yahdi millati hiya aqwa. Wa yubashiru al mu'minina al ladina ya'maluna al salihati anna lahum ajran. This Qur'an, in Surah al Isra, Allah says, it guides you to that which is upright. And not just that, وَيُبَشِّرُ And it gives good news or glad tidings to the believers. You believe in Allah and everything Allah ordered you to believe in. Such as the pillars of Iman and everything comes up from them. And it gives them glad tidings. And those who do good deeds, the believers who do good deeds, that they will have a great reward on the day of judgment. Allah also says in Surah Ibrahim, the Surah Ibrahim, كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد. O Muhammad, we sent down to you a book, the Quran, for one purpose, in order to remove mankind from the darkness, i.e., of Shaytan, into the nur, the light of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. By the permission of Allah, this guidance can only be by Allah's leave, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the path of Al-Aziz. Who's Al-Aziz? Allah, the Almighty. Al-Hamid, the all praiseworthy. No one deserves to be praised like Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Ikhwat al-Imani wal-Islam. This is the Quran al kareem Without it, we will be disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and the Quran always must be followed by the second source for Islam, and that is what? The Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Muhammad, Allah says in Surah Nahal, we send down to you a dhikra. What is a dhikra in here? <laughs> Why is Allah referring to us a dhikr in here? <coughs> Al Quran al Kareem, one of the names for the Quran al Kareem. A dhikr. We send down to you a dhikr, Al Quran, so that you would clarify it and explain it to the people or the Prophet Muhammad. How does the Prophet explain the Qur'an? Through his ahadith, statement, through his daily actions, through his mannerism, through his behavior. A comprehensive word for that is what? Through his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything he did for a proof, it's a teaching for us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that was the explanation of the Qur'an al kareem <coughs> So they have to go together. إخوات الإيمان والإسلام الله أوصو ساس وما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا whatever the messenger gives you then take it and whatever he forbids for you then stay away from it واتقوا الله إن الله شديد العقاب and be fearful of Allah indeed his punishment is very painful 
any orders the Prophet ﷺ gives us from his sunnah, we must embrace it without questioning it. Any prohibition the Prophet ﷺ forbade for us in his sunnah, we must embrace it without questioning it. Why am I emphasizing on this? Because unfortunately, there are some so-called Muslims who claim that the Quran is sufficient for them to apply in their life, to apply in their Islam. They are not in need of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad It's a very, very, very small sect. We shouldn't call it a sect. Perhaps a group of people in different countries. But they are there. They are trying to spread their poison, rejecting the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Without it, a person can never be a Muslim. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَلَا تُطْلِبُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ In Surah Muhammad, Allah says, O believers, obey Allah, and obey his messenger. And do not nullify your deeds. And do not cause your worships to be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we have our deeds rejected? Yes, you can have your deeds rejected and not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you an example. One of the most um, one of the most problematic issues that the Muslim Ummah is suffering from today <coughs> is these two sects. Unfortunately, they're out there and they do their best to advocate and promote their, their, their sect or their beliefs, I would say their corrupt beliefs. And we as youth and as adults, we need to be very aware of these two sects because they're very dangerous. And if you don't understand this concept, you might not be able to hold to your deen. You will think that you are holding to your deen, but you are holding to something that is not part of your deen. Maybe innovated to your deen, or anything like that. Now, unfortunately, we have a group of Muslims today who refer to themselves as open-minded Muslims. Listen to this carefully. They have a special term called liberal Muslims. Their main aim is to enjoy life to the fullest. Is to do as you please, as long as you have Allah and his messenger in your heart. As long as you believe in Allah and Islam and his messenger in your heart. You don't have to wear the hijab because hijab is not Islamic. Perhaps the hijab existed 15 centuries ago in Medina and Arabia, but not in our society today. This is their claim, one of their main claims. No niqab, no hijab. And many other rituals from Islam, they try to deny. When it comes to equality, when it comes to LGBTQ community, they fight for their rights very badly. And they say we need to embrace these new ideas, these new thoughts. We need to embrace them as Muslims and we need to be civilized. We need to what? Be compatible with our society today. Leave certain teachings of Islam back 15 centuries ago. Can we call these people Muslims? No, we cannot call them Muslims. But trust me, they have the most social media platforms today. Trying to inject this new idea of Islam. Claiming that they're trying to reform Islam to bring the new Islam to the new societies and to the new era of the 21st century. As a Muslim, are you allowed to learn Islam from these people? Of course not. Why? Because the one who made Islam or created Islam is who? It's Allah. Islam is not man-made like Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism or atheism. They're invented by man. They're introduced to humans by other men, like you and me. They eat and drink, they sleep, they get tired. They have defic deficiency, imperfection, they make mistakes, they commit sins. But Islam is godly made. It's a revelation from Allah. It's the deen of Adam, the deen of Noah, the deen of Ibrahim, the deen of all of the prophets of Allah <laughs> It cannot contain any deficiency or mistakes or imperfections. It's perfect. So when Allah prescribed Islam for Adam, for Nuh, for Muhammad He prescribed it perfectly. 
perfectly for all locations. Pay attention to this. Islam and its Sharia, it's perfect and compatible with all locations, whether you're from London or from Mecca or from Pakistan or from New Zealand, doesn't matter where you're from. Islam fits with all. For all locations and for all cultures, whether it's an African culture, whether it's an Arab culture, European culture, Asian culture, Islam will fit and will perfect your culture for you. You would not take it off, but will correct it, rectify it, and perfect it for you. Like, you know, the Arabs used to have many cultures before Islam came to them. When Islam came, it is not to say Islam wiped off those cultures, but what it did, it corrupted <coughs> those cultures and made them Islamically acceptable and preserved it for the people. Different than Christianity. When the Christians go, invade a country, divide and conquer, they will rip off your culture, they will rip off your language, and force you to accept Christianity like they did in America, in Australia, in New Zealand, in, in South America. What are the original people of this land? What language do they speak in South America? Spanish, Portuguese. Is this the language they spoke at that time before the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Romans and the, and the French and the English went and invaded South and North America? That's not the language they spoke. That's not the religion they had. That's not the culture they had. They were forced into this. But whereas Islam, when it came up from Mecca, and it went to North Africa, it went to the Middle East, it went to Asia, you see the Asians until today, they have their own culture, their own language. You go to North Africa, they still have the Amazigh language, the Amazigh culture. You go to West Africa, they still speak their language. They still kept their surnames and their names. Islam did not come to destroy cultures, but it came to civilize cultures and advance them and make them better and acceptable. Islamically, did not bully people. It came to benefit you, whereas the others came to invade you, take your natural sources, your riches, your wealth, and force you into their being. Now, which one is a more civilized religion, Islam or Christianity? It's not comparable, Ikhwat al Iman and Islam. At least half of this Islamic lands we see on earth today were spread just because of trade, because of the honesty and the loyalty of Muslim traders at those golden generations, which we are aiming to revive today. So, Ikhwat al-Imani with Islam, holding to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad so never denied it. So these extremely liberal Muslims, extremely open-minded Muslims, they try to reform Islam and say, we need to have a new Islam, a westernized Islam for our society today, so we can fit in. All of this, who's behind all of this movement? This movement started from the start of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century. Is the people of pure disbelief and kufr, the people who advocate and promote atheism. They're, these are the same people who strongly and forcibly promote LGBTQ community, promote many, many different things which are considered to be horribly major sins in Islam and in all other religions. They have fed these ideas by the enemies of religion, by the enemies of God, the followers of the pure shaitan Iblis, atheism on earth, bring paganism again like it was before Islam came. Paganism was widely spread Everywhere on earth before the Prophet came out as Allah's Prophet. So they are fed with these people and they try and confuse and deceive Muslim innocent uh, youth. So never take Islam from these people. Yes, Islam brings you freedom that no other civilization or system or way of life provides for you. Why? Because Islam gives you the liberty or the freedom that has a limit, that has a boundary. And the boundaries of Islam are the boundaries of Allah. Allah says, وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْتَدُوهَا Repeat in the Quran, Allah says this ayah. These are the limits of Allah, so do not cross them. Why? Anything, bear this in mind, brothers and sisters, Anything that Islam made haram or forbidden, 
It is not because Allah does not want us to enjoy ourselves and have this total freedom and flexibility, do as you please. No, never like that. Allah only made it forbidden and haram because it is in one way or another harmful for you or for those around you or the environment and society around you. Let's think of drugs, haram. Drugs harm you and harm those around you and harm your own family. Gambling, major sins. It's harmful for you and it's harmful for society, harmful for the economy and worse than that, Harmful for your own family. If you are someone addicted to gambling, your family will suffer. And it's one of the worst major issues here in the West. Drinking and consuming intoxications. Isn't it one of the main issues? Today, people die because of addiction to drugs, addictions of alcohol. Allah forbid that lie. Because it's harmful for you. You might say, oh, I'm a moderate person, I only drink some, I smoke some, I only do it for myself. You're harming yourself still. You're influencing others. The Prophet says, No harm and no harming. Don't harm yourself and don't harm others. That's the principle in Islam. So when Allah forbids something, it means it is harmful for you or for those around you. Stay away from it. Sometimes you might not understand why it is haram. Often it's because you did not study Islam in details. But sometimes you might, even if you study, you still don't get it. As a Muslim, what do you do? You surrender to Allah's wisdom. You surrender to Allah's wisdom. And you say, Allah knows best. He fashioned me. He created me. He knows how my system works inside. He knows what my desires crave for. So he designed a way of life for me. And I should follow this way of life to the best I can. So that I will be successful in this life and in the next. That's the principle of Ikhwat al-Iman al-Islam. Never accept Islam or the ideas of these people who refer to themselves. Yeah, we are free, we do as we please. We tell you do as you please today, but you will never be able to do as you please tomorrow when you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam is fit for all locations, for all cultures, for all communities, and most importantly for all what? Years and times. Very important. Even in hundred years, in million years, if we live, then Islam will still be the solution. Islam will still dominate. Islam will still be the best way of life and the only truth. Allah says to Muhammad and his followers, hold very tight to that which has been revealed to you. Indeed, you are upon the straight path. What else? What else would you want from this ayat? So this is one group. Extremely open-minded Muslims. They are very dangerous. They are the ones who are causing lots of you major trouble. I'll give you one example. One of students of mine, unfortunately. He's perhaps only 13 or 14. He's been studying Islamic studies and comes from a religious family in London and studied Islam for at least five or four years. During COVID-19 lockdown, for at least one year and a half, did not go to school. And during this time, he was communicating with his atheist teacher who teaches him in secondary school. And this atheist teacher, during this COVID-19 lockdown, what did he do? He saw the innocence of this young boy. He saw how innocent he is, took advantage of that, introduced him to atheism. After a year and a half of communication secretly without the knowledge of his parents, what happened? What did this boy do? Mom, dad, I denounce the belief in Allah. I don't believe God exists. I am an atheist. This is a true story. His father calls me almost crying. What do I do? He denounced Islam completely. Why? Because he was brainwashed. He was communicating with people who give him the wrong knowledge about Islam. He denounced Islam completely. What did his parents do? They couldn't convince him. I spoke to him. Different mashayikh and different brothers spoke to him. He's not taking it. And you know how it is. 
in this society. So his parents decided to take him to Africa. He's been there since then. Alhamdulillah, spoke to his parents recently. He's coming back bit by bit to the deen. Bit by bit, he's coming back to the deen. I spoke to him online when he was there in Africa. I said, why these questions? He was asking me, why is there suffering on earth? Why doesn't God stop the suffering? This is the same person who was learning just Amma with me and other teachers. The same person who learned about Islam with me and other teachers. What we are trying to deliver to you in here is this message. You're never safe. Shaitan will never leave you alone. Shaitan was your enemy the moment you were born. Remember this. Every born, every newborn, the moment you come out from the womb of your mother, what does Shaitan do to you? Pinches you. Hopes you. That's why you hear that cry out when the newborn comes out from the womb of their mother. This is the hadith of the Prophet. So that pinch, you know what it means? The shaitan is declaring enmity and a war against you from the day you came to this dunya to your test. And he will keep trying to deceive you in this life until your last minute of this life. That's why. The Prophet took us a dua. Allahumma inna a'udhu bika min adab jahannam, wa min adab al-qabr, wa min fitnati al-mahya wa al-mamad, wa min fitnati al-masih al-dajjal. Wallah, I seek refuge in you from the trials and the tribulations of life and death. The ulama say in here, when a person is about to die, shaitan will try to grab his last chance against you. Comes to you while you're experiencing the days of death and tries to misguide you and make you forget about saying the statement, La ilaha illallah. That's why you see some people, let's be more precise, some Muslims, while dying, singing haram songs, uttering very, very bad words. Shaitan defeated them. And some saying, La ilaha illallah. Some saying good words. This does not necessarily mean a sign you go to Jahannam or Jannah. But this takes us back to the hadith of the Prophet. Seek refuge in Allah. From the test of shaitan when you are dying, he would come and try to deceive you last minute. That's why we go back to the principle is Allahumma yamun tabbit al-qulub, tabbit qalbi, O Allah, you're the controller of hearts, make me firm upon your religion, i.e. until I meet you, Allah. Very important. Very important. Akhwat al-Imani wa islam the time is very restricted, it's come to an end, but briefly in five minutes, I'm going to talk about the second sect who are totally the opposite of those who are extremely <coughs> open-minded Muslims. And when you are extreme in anything, there's always a question mark about your, 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 your commitment. You can only be extreme in Islam in the love and the remembrance of Allah and the love of His Messenger. You cannot be extreme in your Salat because you will be committing what? Bid'ah. You can't pray all night long and all day long because you will be wrong in your body you would be wrong in your family who have the right upon you and that's how it is everything has its own right the only thing that has no limit is the love and your loyalty and your trust in allah and the dhikr of allah ya ayyuhalladhina amanu dhkuru allah dhikran kathira allah in the quran when he talks about his dhikr do it do it as much as you can because it will only better you as a muslim but anything else can cause you to deviate can cause you to harm yourself. So, Ikhwat al Iman in Islam, the real freedom comes from where? From Islam. The other set are the opposite of the other ones, are the ones who are extremely extreme when it comes to halal and haram, when it comes to kafir and, and mubtada innovator, such as the khawarij. Those Muslims who anything he do, brother is haram, and he has no idea what he's talking about. Brother, this is kufr. This guy is careful. He sees him a Muslim. No, he's careful because he's done this and that. Do you understand the, the concept of takfir? You're making takfir on people, accusing people of being kufr, whereas you see them attend the same message with you, whereas you see them saying, La ilaha illallah, well. just because they commit a sin or two, you make takfir on them, or you consider them to be very sinful, and you, you express pride before them, and you belittle them. No, no, no. If you humble yourself before Allah, Allah will elevate your ranks. Treat Muslims fairly. 
it is very important to stay away from extremism. As it is reported to us, be careful when it comes to extremism in religion. It will destroy you. It will destroy you. That's why today we see lots of issues in the Ummah. Making takfir on this person, making takfir on this person, and all this does is divide the unity of the Muslim Ummah. And it's one of the main causes for the suffering of the Ummah. Whereas Allah says, all of you together, be together and hold tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who makes halal and haram is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't understand or if it's not clear for you whether it is haram or not, refer it to the people of knowledge. <coughs> refer it to the people of knowledge. Allah says, Ask the people of knowledge if you did not know. Because we see this is a trend today. You've left Islam just because you've said something or you've done something. Who are you to label someone with kufr just because you thought they did that or they said that? No. This goes back to the scholars. Stay away from that. Stay away from that. Because this extremism will lead to what? Will lead to misguidance. Will lead to violence, to aggression. To deviation and worse than that to innovation both parties the extremely liberal ones and the extremely extreme tough ones huh? they will start adding into the deen things which are not from Islam and this is what we call what bid'ah innovation which is considered to be the fourth major sin in Islam the fourth worst sin in Islam after kufr and shirk and hypocrisy nifa comes what Innovation. Why is Christianity Christianity today? Why is Christianity Christianity today? Because Isa did not come with Christianity, salam. he came with Islam. So what did they do after a decade or two when the true followers of Isa died? The Romans, who were originally pagans there in Palestine, what did they do? With the deception of the Jewish community there, what did they do? They made the Romans who embraced Islam confused. They mixed Islam with paganism because the Romans were very uh, uh, familiar with the pagan rituals. So they mixed Islam with paganism and came up with what? Something called Christianity today. He says the Son of God or Trinity is God in three. A'udhu billahi min dalik. May Allah protect us from that. <laughs> so they mixed Islam and paganism and they came up with what? A religion called Christianity. <laughs> Allah says, they innovated this. Allah never prescribed this for them. Whereas in the Bible itself, you will find no concept of Trinity. Nowhere where Isa is saying, I am God, worship me. Where I am your Lord, follow me. Nowhere. But you go and explain it to them. Because innovation, and that's why the Muslim Ummah is suffering today, because they introduced many rituals and many worships which are originally not from Islam. The Prophet never knew about them. The Sahaba never knew about them. And here we have them today. What do they do? Because of these innovations, the innovator will consider himself that I am right. This is the true version of Islam. But someone who is truly following Islam, trying to present Islam there, but know you're wrong. And I advise you that this is not right. What happens? A conflict comes in between them and then division, confusion. And then the Ummah will pay the price for that. <laughs> That's why we go back to the root, the Quran and the Sunnah, based upon the understanding of the first past generation of this Ummah, the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. their offsprings and the offsprings of their offsprings. For as long as we relate to them, when we, when we read the Quran and when we read the Hadith, we are on the right path by the tawfiq and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam does not need any modifying, any um, reforming. Islam is already perfect. Some scholars say this is the last verse revealed in the Quran Kareem. And some say the ayah the brother mentioned earlier at the start. This ayah Allah says, today I've completed for you your religion. And I perfected upon you my bounties. 
and of accept for you Islam as your only religion. Who are you to come and tell me we need to reform Islam? Or we need to add something new to Islam? Or take off something from Islam? Who are you to question the judgment and the wisdom of Allah? You are nothing but a kafir, a non-Muslim who has hate or enmity against, against Islam. Who wants to corrupt the idea of Islam and the path of Muslims. Therefore, I must never listen to you. As a young person who's trying to learn Islam, who's trying to hold touch with their deen, always refer back to the people of Islam, the scholars, the mashayikh, your teachers in madrasas. Alhamdulillah, refer to them. And this is the best way to preserve your, your religion. Islam has been passed to us for the last 15 centuries, generation after generation. Uh -huh. And it is our duty now to pass it to the next generation. Here, the management, the Imam of this masjid, for example, the Mashaykh of this masjid are doing their best for you, the youth. They brought you here from last night, you were here. They bring speakers from outside uh, this city. Why? Because they're doing their duty. They understood <coughs> the trust Allah gave them to deliver Islam to you. They're doing their best. So that tomorrow, when they stand before Allah, Allah, I established the Madrasa. I brought scholars. I brought speakers. I delivered the message. And that's all I could do. They have something to answer Allah with. And you, the youth specifically, you need to do the same. You need to learn Islam and make sure where you learn it is the correct source. Okay? And you pass it to the next generation. Okay? Because we never know what we will be facing in the next few years, the next decades in societies like that. Therefore, holding to the original Islam, there's only one Islam, and that's the Islam of the Prophet Muhammad. It's very essential. And not just that, we are not like the Yahud, we keep it to ourselves, no, we share it. We share it with the next generation. Convey for me even if it is a verse from the Quran. So it is your duty to learn it now. You are at the stage of learning it, at the stage of implementing it. The next stage is what? To pass it. And this takes us back to the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad. The best one of you is the one who learns the Quran and then teaches the Quran. You are the stage of learning the Quran because Quran is Islam and Islam is Quran. You are learning the Quran now as a young boy or a young girl. Once learned it, your next duty is what? Is to share it with the next generation. May Allah give us the tawfiq and the strength to do that as perfectly as we can. Ameen ya Rabbi Alameen. اللهم عز إسلام المسلمين واحفظ شباب المسلمين وبنات المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم فقهنا في الدين وثبتنا على الدين اللهم يا مثبت القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مثبت القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مثبت القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبارك الله فيكم جميعا He came all the way from London, mashallah, to enlighten us, to give us the tools we need in order to hold on to our deen, to hold on our religion. This is a very important part of our life, especially when you're growing up in challenging environment, non-Islamic environment. We have a duty and responsibility to hold to that religion until we depart from this world. So in the next few minutes, we are going to open the door for questions to ask Al-Akh Ja'far here. Uh, for the sisters, you can write down your questions and you have about 15 to 20 minutes for those questions. So please feel free to ask any question. More important one related to the topic, but the Sheikh is quite happy to take any question. But the key question first will be relevant to the topic. But if you have any other question, maybe it's troubling you, you need kind of, you know, clarification. Al Akh Jafar is here. Yes, Brother Muhammad. They can't hear. They can't hear the other side. Did they hear the lecture? Did you hear the lecture? I hope they did. <laughs> <laughs> the volume is low. The volume is low. 
If I took in this one, the volume is high, they can hear from this one. Can he, can the sisters hear from this one? Okay, no worry, we'll sort that one out, yeah? Yes, brother. <coughs> Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Brothers, what? Can Brothers, some silence, please? That's this is the most important, important part because any question, it may be relevant to you as well. <coughs> so it's very important to listen to the question and listen to the answer. So I've heard from a lot of people, uh, including my mum especially, of course, that, uh, that there are certain sports uh, around the world that are sort of forbidden in Quran, uh, more into the Sunba schools. What, what would be harm about the Sunba schools? All sports are allowed in Islam as long as they don't cross the boundaries of Allah. In reality, you're highly recommended to be as sporty and as active as you can in Islam. Al-Mu'min al-Qawim, ahabbu in Allah. Al-Mu'min al-Da'i, a stronger believer is more believable to Allah than a weaker believer, spiritually and physically together, okay? So, yes, there might be some sports out there which Islam in one way or another prohibited, such as hitting or targeting the face specifically. This is prohibited in Islam. Why? Because Allah says, we created man beautifully. Okay? Fi ahsani taqween. And then someone comes, for fun, for entertainment, he smashes that face which Allah created, just for fun and entertaining others. Islam does not allow that. You can do that for self-defense, with the proper equipment guarding yourself, but not for entertainment. Targeting the face specifically, that's where the order comes in Islam, and, and it is allows it. But any other sports, as far as I know, it is allowed as long as the boundaries of Islam are not crossed, like when it comes to free mixing and so on and so forth, yes. Now, yes. So what's it like, you play with people at school who are Christian, like play tag and stuff like that, and how will that be if you make your family suffer? It is allowed to play with your, uh, in your school, with your mates, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, that's fine. How does gambling make your family suffer? When someone starts to gamble, and makes it, okay? Obviously, you will lose more money than winning. That's how it is. And then it becomes an addiction, just like drugs. You will be obsessed with it with time. And this is one of the worst major issues here in this country, gambling, okay? And then you will be obsessed with spending perhaps most of your money on these machines and these games and betting. And then you end up spending the money of your children that you were meant to buy them food with, stationaries, pay the rent with, and then you will start facing many, many different problems, and lots of them end up to be what? Homeless on the streets, unfortunately. So that's why gambling is, is haram, because number one is unfair gain, and number two, it causes so much damage to families, and there is more disadvantages to that, understood? No worries, a lot of people claim to follow the Quran and Sunnah, but there's a lot of deviancy in terms of like sects and stuff. So how do we go about seeking knowledge and knowing what's correct? It's an important question. Lots of people claim to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, but at the same time, uh, they ascribe themselves to deviant sects, wrong sects. Okay, we are not here to judge who's a true follower of the Sunnah and who's not. But we are, hard, we are here to implement it ourselves. Allah made it very clear who's the person of the Sunnah, who's the person of Iman, who's the person of Jannah. He says, Wal asr, inna al insan ala fi khusr. I swear by time, all men are in a state of loss. Everyone is a loser in plain English. Every single human being is a loser according to Allah, except there's an exception. 
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. Except if you are one of these people. الذين آمنوا. Except if you are a believer. What does it mean to be a believer? To be a muwahid. You believe in the oneness of Allah and you believe correctly in every in everything Allah called you to believe in. Such as the six pillars of Iman and everything that comes, the branches of the six pillars of Iman. So you believe in it correctly and plainly as the Quran states and as the Sunnah states. <laughs> the people of Tawheed, <laughs> and they do salihat, good deeds. This means following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. And they advise each other to remain truthful. And they advise each other to practice patience. So these are the people who are the righteous. These are the people who will be the people of Jannah. These are the true followers of Muhammad. So name yourself wherever you want to name yourself. Doesn't matter. As long as you are avoiding names which are a bit problematic. It's always recommended to avoid labeling yourself with something that people, huh? it always causes drama and fitna. But I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Who was sabnaakum al-Muslimin? Allah named us Muslims. So refer yourself to yourself as a Muslim. Do not go into fine details. What matters you is what Allah thinks of you, not what others. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu alaykum anfusakum. La yadurrukum man dalla idha tadaytum. And this is the principle, all believers, in Surah Al-Mayn Allah says, all believers, take care of yourselves. Do not, all believers, take care of yourselves. For as long as you are guided, no one can harm you from the misguided. No one can misguide you if you are guided. As long as you are implementing the Sunnah yourself and following the correct path, you don't have to worry about the rest. Okay? How do you know that you are on the correct path? Alhamdulillah. You're not committing any sins. You're not committing any major sins to be more specific. You're not committing any innovations. You want to know whether you're committing innovations or not? Question every worship you do. Every ritual you do. Is this from the Quran? Is this from the Sunnah? If it's yes, you're on the right path. If it's not, you're not on the right path. Correct yourself. Simple as that. You don't have to be, you know, give loyalty to a certain sect or to a certain thing. Follow Quran and Sunnah. As simple as that. We leave it the way the Sahaba left it for us. But if we complicate things, that's where the issue comes. That's where the division will come. So that's how you know. If you bring yourself to account, you will find out whether you're on the right path or not. And Allah is best. The beauty for about is the beauty about Islam. It's number one because it's the truth. Yeah? It's the source of truth because Allah al Haq is the source of the truth. And not just that, and the second most beautiful thing about Islam is what? It's its clarification and simplicity. It's very simple to understand Islam. Very simple. Unless we complicate it, then we will be confused. All of these books of Aqidah and different sects never existed in the first century or two centuries after the Prophet They were only written after when people started introducing new things to Islam. The scholars were obligated to write these books in order to clarify uh, wrong from right and right from, from wrong. That's the only purpose they wrote. Otherwise, you will have the Quran and Hadith. Simple as that. Now. Can you give me um, the bombs or head or learning and memorizing the Quran? Can I give you something? Me and the brothers, can you give us some tips on how we can like, learn and memorize the Quran, make it more powerful? You already have the first tip, alhamdulillah. You have the desire. If you want to achieve something important, you have to desire it. You have to like it. If you don't like it, learn how to love it and how to like it. Learn how to. How do you learn about it? By start studying and exploring its importance, its virtues, its beauty, its success. Once you know it and you understand it very well, you will desire it if you like it. Once you desire it, like you saw alhamdulillah, then at that time, it takes what? Commitment, determination, loyalty to your task, okay? Loyalty as well as hard work and time. It takes all of this. It takes all of this. So if you have a desire, it needs to be followed by what? Commitment and determination. Many people desire to do many things in life, but are they committed to start this journey? That's the problem. They lack commitment. To be committed it means you be firm, but you want it, and I'm going to do something about it. And it takes a sacrifice. Sacrificing your time, 
sacrificing parts of your wealth, sacrificing your entertainment, your uh, certain enjoyment. You have to, to become a professional school man. You have to train a lot, isn't that true? Five days a week at least. To become hafid, to memorize the Quran correctly, then it has to be five times a week memorizing. Each day has to be at least one hour, two hours. Do not come once a week to the madrasa, one hour or two hours, and expect yourself to be a hafid within two or three years. You might memorize if you had special talent, but it would be forgotten very quickly. So it's got to be determination, commitment, and time. Time. It takes time. Don't rush yourself. Don't rush yourself. And obviously, you've got to be surrounded by what I mentioned earlier, the correct environment. You want to memorize the Quran? Be with the people of the Quran. If you want to be a professional sportman, be with professional people out of this field. And that's how it is in every aspect of life. The brother said, we're hearing on news, recently on news, that the Taliban in Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan, called Taliban, they ban women from attending university. What is that according to Islam? We've heard this news from where? <coughs> from BBC, ITV, Sky News, Western media news, we have it. Are we obligated in Islam to believe everything we hear from the news? Ya ayyuha alladheena aman in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu. If we receive news from someone, especially if this someone is not a Muslim or a fasiq or considered to be a sinner, we need to investigate. That's step one. I'm not denying the news, but at the same time I'm not believing it foolishly, straight away. Okay? The question is, is it true that the Taliban banned women from attending universities? Specifically speaking, universities, not college or education. We have to be very precise in it. I'm not here pro Taliban or against Taliban. We're here to state the truth. Okay? We have nothing attached or related to Taliban, but in Islam we're taught and we're obligated to say the truth. So, there is always a question mark whether this news is accurate or inaccurate. Let's say it's accurate. In Islam, you're not allowed to ban anyone or to disallow anyone from educating themselves, whether a man or a woman. One of the most precious scholars in Islam was a woman, and a young woman, and that was who? Aisha radiallahu anha arda, and she's the best woman. She's the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Yet she was better in knowledge, better than thousands of men there in Mecca and Medina. Isn't this a sign that Islam promotes and advocates education for women? So if it is true, then it is wrong Islamically to ban women from advancing in their education. Islamically is wrong. But if it is not true, then Alhamdulillah, so it's not happening, the sisters are educating themselves. But if it is true, if Taliban truly ban women from attending university, then before we judge anyone in Islam, why are you stopping them from going to uni? Is it because you don't have facilities? Is it because you can't afford it? Or is it because you're against the idea of women being educated? If you're against the idea of educating women, then that's a problem in Islam. Islam does not allow it. But if because you're not, you don't have the facilities to facilitate that, or you don't have the finance or anything, you have nothing against it, then this is a matter of political issue that we'll deal with it with time. So Allah knows best. We're against anyone who stops women from educating themselves and advancing, whether in Afghanistan, whether in here, whether in Africa, against it completely. But there is always an explanation for every situation Allah knows best. This question from the sisters say, is it haram for women or for girls to wear makeup? Is it halal for women and girls to wear makeup? Yes, it is halal as long as this makeup is not exposed to men who are stranger to you, not mahram to you. A wife can put as much makeup as she wants for her husband or for her sisters in Islam, in Walima, women between women as well as a girl in front of her father, in front of her brother, in front of her husband-to-be. Uh, I mean her husband, not husband-to-be. So that's Allah. But putting on makeup and taking your beauty outside to the public, that's what Islam is allows in. Another question from the sisters. Most of the time, my children ask me why they are learning the Quran, though they don't understand it. 
why it is very important to learn the Quran as long as we are in a non-Muslim country? It is a very important question. Many of the youth in here, they learn the Quran, they memorize the Quran, but they do not understand the wordings of the Quran. Therefore, we acknowledge in many madrasas, in many Islamic centers, we have a major shortcoming of explaining the meaning of the Quran. We focus on memorizing mainly and learning how to read it, but we don't focus on understanding its language. And that's because it all goes back to time. It all goes back to time and facilities, okay? But Alhamdulillah, you learn the Quran because it's your way of life, because it's the book of Allah, because it's your guide, because it's your savior in this life and in the next. But you will never taste the sweetness of the Quran. I understand the question of where they're coming from. You will never understand the real concept of the Quran until you understand its language, you understand its meaning. Once you understand its meaning, you will taste its sweetness when applying it in your life. Once you taste its sweetness because you understand it, at that time you will never ask a question like that because you know this is the only way of life for you in order to succeed in this life and in the next. Exactly. Last question, if there are 25 prophets of Allah mentioned in the Quran, and we know there are over 1,000 prophets in total. Why did the remaining prophets did not get mentioned in the Quran? Only 25 were mentioned. Yes, it is true that 25 prophets mentioned in the Quran only. And many of them were mentioned in the Sunnah or in the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad too. Because the Quran is a very comprehensive book, it did not talk about the prophets. Allah mentioned these prophets in the Quran, some of them their names only. Some of them bits here and there, information about them, and some of them, their full stories like Yusuf, Musa, alayhi salam, Ibrahim, their full stories in the Quran. Why? Ibra. Allah says, Ibra as a lesson for us to learn from their legacy, to learn from their success. That's why the stories of the uh, prophets are in the Quran. But as I mentioned, the Quran contains, listen to this, the Quran contains of three main concepts. The, the Quran has three main ideas. Number one, a percentage of the Quran focuses on the Sharia of Allah, i.e., the rules, what you should do, what you should not do, the halal and the haram, how to pray, how to do Hajj, how to treat your parents. So these are the Sharia. Okay. The second concept idea of the Quran is about information, al-akhbar, Allah informing us, educating us things that mankind never knew before the book was revealed to them. For example, how many heavens are there? About the day of judgment, about the purpose of the mountains, the purpose of the ocean. Allah informed us of many things in the Quran which mankind had no chance of knowing them even if they achieved the highest level of science. They would never know there are seven heavens, the day of judgment. So the second concept of the Quran is al-akhbar, which means information. And the third one, is an asa, stories. It's at least 30% of the Quran is about stories. Stories of prophets, stories of good people, stories of bad people. Why stories of bad people? So that we learn from their lessons and we don't commit the crimes they committed. Like Qarun and Fir'aun and Haman. Okay? So the Quran, it's not a book that narrates to us or teaches only stories, but it's a very comprehensive book and that's what makes the Quran unique and special. Miraculous books. Yeah. Next question is from the sister. Says, is it haram to be in a classroom with classmates of opposite gender when you go to the mixed school? So if I'm sitting here, my next uh, person seeing me is a male here, I'm a girl. So is it haram to go in the school? The general principle in Islam, free mixing. Why is it called free mixing? It means willingly and happily you choose to free mix. If you go to the supermarket, did you choose to free mix with women? No, you were obligated because that's how it is. If you went to the Kaaba and do tawaf, did you choose to be doing tawaf around uh, women? No, you didn't. So this is not free mixing. We have to understand the concept of free mixing. Free mixing is when you choose to go a party where there is men and women doing things which are not allowed in Islam. Free mixing is when you have the choice to sit next to a girl, whereas you are a girl, and you choose to sit next to a boy. That's what's haram, okay? So if you can avoid it, okay, in your class, okay, then avoid it. But if you can't avoid it, 
Then do your best to speak to your parents about it, speak to the school principal, to sit next to a girl of the same gender, a boy next to a boy. Because we live in a society where they do not, unfortunately, provide for us segregated schools. Therefore, it is necessity. We need to attend school. We can't be unlettered and illiterate as an ummah. We're the ummah of education and civilization. So we need to attend schools as long as the boundaries of Islam and the manners of Islam are with us. And this is a sign from the sister that she's doing her best to preserve her Muslim identity. She does not want to free mix, but she's in a classroom where it's free mixed. The best you can do, avoid as much contact as you can with the opposite gender and sit with the same gender to minimize, to minimize that free mixing and Allah knows best. The next question from the girls as well. Why are men allowed to marry more than one wife? Yet women are allowed. The simple answer, because Allah says so. Allah says, marry however you please, twos, threes, and fours. However, listen to this, you need to finish the ayah. If you fear that you will be unfair to any of them, then you must marry only one. You must marry only one. If you're physically unable to, huh, to deliver your duty to your wives, because there are more than one, then you must only what? Marry one. If you're financially unable, then you must marry only one. If you're emotionally and whatever it is, you must marry only one. Otherwise, you will be sinning. You will be sinning. Of course, there is other purposes why Allah prescribed it. Allah does not allow anything except there is wisdom behind it. And one of the most, one of the biggest wisdom behind this, it's because the population of women are always bigger than the population of men. It's because a man, uh, men are needed more than women for labor, for war, for conflicts, for battles. Huh? When there is an army, when there is a war, the majority of the soldiers are what? Men. Are men. So they are needed for many, many different purposes. Okay? Men and women are equal in many things and they are unequal in many other things. When they said zakaw, can the man is not like a uh, male is not like a female, a female is not like a male. They have different duties, different nature, but at the same time, they serve each other and they cannot exist without each other. Simple as that. <laughs> Another one from the sisters. I know ulama, the scholars, say the music is haram. But when youth come together, especially girls, they like some music just for having fun. The question is, <coughs> What is the exchange for that? What's the alternative to that? And if, is it okay for girls or get ladies only, where there's no mix with men, to have music? The answer is simple, no. You can, there's no alternatives for sins. Listening to music, especially the music of today, that we hear everywhere, is totally corrupted. It's haram in Islam. So therefore, I am not going to ask you to replace music with nasheed, because nasheed is not for that purpose. And not all nasheeds are halal, by the way. Some, most of, let me not exaggerate, lots of nasheeds today are more like music than nasheed itself. Okay? So therefore, I would say, replace that music with fun. You can talk, you can chat, you can discuss something, you can read something, you can do poetry, um, you can read statements, hadith of the Prophet, stories. There is always, there is always a way for halal entertainment. You just have to look for it. But once the problem is, once you become an addict to music, you're obsessed with music, then that's where the problem becomes a problem. Okay? So don't get yourself obsessed with music. Stay away from it. Mizmar al-Shaytan is the instrument of the shaytan himself, as it is referred to in Islam. Stay away from it from day one, because it's just an addiction. We know people are obsessed with it. Once you're obsessed, then you need to deal with the obsession, not the music itself. Get rid of this obsess obsession so that you can stop listening to music. So I would say replace it with good speech, whether narrating stories or talking about history, talking about something entertaining as long as it's hard enough. Exactly. The next question, maybe the last one, because Asr is fast approaching. How to choose good friends to our children, especially in the non-Muslim environment? Our children, especially teenagers, are very difficult to control and they're trying to choose a friends of their own choice. 
and becoming very difficult to explain to them whether this is the correct friend or not. So what advice you can give how to choose the good friends? Number one, before solving out this issue, you have to understand and accept that this is one of the biggest challenges that we face here in, in the societies. You have to accept that it is a challenge. You can't, you can't be faking yourself saying, I can be in control, in full control of my teenager, daughter or son. You have to accept that it is a challenge and you have to accept that it is not totally up to you. Because why? Because this, the way the society is designed in here, okay? You're not in full control. You can never be in full control. Only Allah can be in full control, subhanAllah. Only Allah guides. We see from families who have nothing to do with Islam, their son or their daughter will emerge out as a pious, righteous person, and revert to Islam and then become a good preacher to Islam. And we see the opposite. From a pious family, someone comes out the wrong way, generally speaking, okay? But we have to accept that it is a challenge. Once accepting it, now you're dealing with someone who is a challenge to you. Therefore, you have to plan, plan for this challenge very wisely. You have to compromise somehow. Not harm, compromise. Okay? Compromise and obviously do your best to advise, to educate, to uh, be as caring as you can. Give them enough love, enough attention, enough time. And if you give all of this, and they choose to rebel, and they choose to disobey. There's nothing you can do, brother, in Islam, except your du'a. So you make du'a for your son and your daughter. You try to be friend with them. Spend as much time as you can with them. Okay? And the rest, of, of course, educating them, and the rest will be left with Allah. As Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ Fear Allah as much, as much as you can. Now. Uh, because of the time, I have more, I have more questions here. We shall will continue the questions after Salah. Because we've got only five minutes before Salah. We want, some brothers want to perform wudu. Some of them want to be ready for Salah. So we're going to uh, spend the remaining few minutes to get ready for Salah. And I need a volunteer to perform the Adhan here. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yeah. 